Good morning, nerds. I'm Allison, and welcome back to episode 457 of the Blah 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 podcast. Today, we felt the need to talk about a dire problem festering under our very noses. Want to spill the tea on that, Carson? Sure. Hey, nerds. I am Carson. This problem has caused countless devastation, billions of dollars in damages each year, committed millions of murders, and the extinction of hundreds of species. Today, we are talking about invasive species. <laughs> Originally from Asia, the Bigrata Hilaris is now making its way from California into okay. Texas. It's been devastating the crops in California. Three years ago, I never saw a lionfish in my life. This is a, an increasingly common occurrence and it is affecting the uh, the catch of the lobster but it's it's really strange i mean having fished all my life and uh, you know we put ourselves through college with a lot you know with the fishing business kuna kamuduru kaliko kamaingia na wakanielezea vizuri wakaniambia ni ni hiyo tuta tuta kusolita sasa ile kitu na sasema nimekosa kitu ya kwanza ni hiyo hiyo nyanya ndio nilikuwa ninategemea kwa kufindi familia yangu Invasive species seem pretty problematic. Uh, just so our viewers have a concise definition of what invasive species even are, according to the National Wildlife Federation, they are any kind of living organism that is not native to an ecosystem and causes harm. Pretty vague description, if you ask me. Yeah, I agree. And some little plan from somewhere else may not seem all that bad, but as we saw earlier in the video, they can severely impact the people in these communities. But I don't know anything, so we brought on an expert to tell us all about a new approach to solve this invasive species issue. Here is the co-founder of BioInvasion. Welcome, Dr. Baskaran. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about BioInvasion and what you guys have been working on there. Yeah, so my fellow co-founders and I were really bothered by the way that the most successful existing solutions seem to involve basically killing off the species and throwing them away, which is really expensive and it's not good for the environment. So we wanted to try to work with the invasive species and see how it can benefit the people it's currently harming. Our idea is to use the supposed waste material from invasive species as an ingredient for crafters in the maker movement. This way, customers will both gain knowledge about invasive species and get to interact more directly with the environment. Huh. So tell me a little bit more about your process. How does it go from some plant in the wild to in the hands of your customers? So before we start making kits, we have to understand what the ecosystem needs. So to start off, we'll send experts out into the field to talk to locals and to study the invasive species and its interactions with the environment. We're also hoping to involve local indigenous communities in this conversation, because we know that groups like the North Fork Mono Tribe and the Association of Ramai Tushaloni are involved in land management. We'd like to take into account tribal priorities and, if possible, include tribal land managers in our leadership. Next, we'll try removing the invasive species in a small area and monitor the result. Once our field team gives the green light, the next step is to harvest it. Here we can help out the affected communities by employing community members to do the harvesting. Basically, we want to give jobs to people who are affected by invasive species while also making sure that the harvesting is done responsibly. Once we've collected the material, we'll bring it to the lab and members of our team will turn the raw materials into something craftable. Of course, we'll remove any parts that are toxic or harmful. Then the kits will get packaged in recycled cardboard boxes, along with an informational pamphlet so that people can learn more about the invasive species that they're working with, and then they get sent out. So what sort of crafts can people make from these kits? There are really endless possibilities. One thing that we're looking into is making paper out of water hyacinth. Hyacinth reproduces through seeds and vegetatively. So we will bake the seeds and thoroughly dry the stolons, and then the plant material can be sent out to be blended and repurposed as crafting paper. We've also been looking at some materials that indigenous people make use of, and one of those is fish leather. We've been adapting those recipes and prototyping on discarded fish skin to create lionfish leather. And we're also looking into donating a portion of our proceeds to a group like the Aspen Institute Artisan Alliance, which supports indigenous artisans. That's awesome. I think it's really cool. It seems to give people more direct connection to these invasive species as they work with them to create these materials. But if you look at some other really common invasive species, cats are easily one of the worst, killing off millions of birds a year. 
So, should I be grabbing my shotgun, getting ready to shoot Mr. Snuffles from across the street? Like, what does bio invasion draw this line for what is an acceptable invasive species to use? Yes, the definition definitely brings up some questions. The bio invasion solution is specifically oriented towards invasive species that are harmful enough that action is needed. Fisheries are already catching lionfish, so in that case it's more a matter of how we can prevent that from going to waste. Hmm. So, invasive species are a bit more complicated of an issue than I had in mind. Interesting. Tying back into the practice of converting invasive species into craft materials, I couldn't help but wonder about the sustainability of this company. There seems to be a lot of moving gears here. Sustainability was definitely a priority when we developed this. From the start of the process, harvesters will avoid the use of chemical removal tools like herbicides, which often do more harm than good. Then when we process the goods, we'll use low energy techniques like air drying, avoid chemicals like bleach, package everything in recycled cardboard, and keep shipping within the country to decrease carbon emissions. When people use the craft kits, they'll be making more sustainable alternatives to things like leather and plastic goods. And at the end of the life cycle, everything can be recycled or composted, so nothing gets sent to the landfill. Oh my goodness, it looks like someone is trying to call in to ask some questions about bio invasion, Dr. Baskaran. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Arana. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I had some questions about the company. So, some invasive species have been known to provide refuge for native plants and animals, such as the tamarisk plant providing shelter for native and endangered bird species. How does bio invasion choose an invasive species? That's certainly a valid concern. When we balance harms and benefits of a species, one of the techniques we'll use is focusing on management rather than eradication. So think of it like pruning a tree. If we're able to decrease the quantity of the species rather than eradicating it, we can mitigate the harms while still allowing it to contribute to the environment. It seems counterintuitive to propose a solution based on consumerism. After all, the transportation of goods is known to be one of the main ways invasive species are introduced to new environments. Consumerism also promotes a linear economy, which isn't sustainable. Is consumerism the answer for bioinvasion? Unfortunately, in our current society, we can't see a way to create this impact without a consumerism-based solution. But bioinvasion is putting the focus on the long-term benefit that comes from promoting healthy ecosystems and helping those who are affected, which discourages exploitation in the short term. And I think it helps that our company is flexible. We're set up to respond to whatever species is currently causing problems. So we don't need to overexploit a single species and we can work with biodiversity rather than limiting it. Thank you for calling in with such wonderful questions, Dr. Arana. I enjoyed hearing about how bioinvasion takes a holistic approach to solving an issue generally resolved through non-environmentally friendly actions. I'm wondering where bioinvasion bioenvisions themselves in the future. Yes, so looking into the future, we foresee a lot of technological advancements. Satellite technology is powerful enough now that it can detect water hyacinth from space. As it becomes even more advanced, able to detect even, say, schools of fish, satellite imagery will provide a new method for detecting and preventing the growth of specific species early on. We are also investigating bioprinting technology, which 3D prints using organic materials. And we predict that in 30 years or so, as 3D printing becomes more accessible for home use, we can produce materials like collagen and cellulose from invasive species for use in bioprinting. Radical. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much, Dr. Boscaron, for joining us on our show. I'm very curious to see where bioinvasion goes in the future. It seems like there are plenty of opportunities to grow as a company. So thanks for listening to the Blah 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 podcast. We hope you all learned some good stuff. To finish some things up, Dr. Boscaron want to share a little video with us all. So let's watch that now. Have an early day. Each domino here represents a neglected environment that has been negatively affected by invasive species. The longer this problem is ignored, more damage will be done. Issues like climate change are only further destabilizing environments and making them more vulnerable to invasion. Increasing numbers of people will see their livelihoods threatened by ecosystem destruction. By invasion sees a way to solve this problem. Let's stop this domino effect and pick up the fallen pieces.